This is week three in our uh, five session study. I remind you, next week we will be here. We will be here on the 20th. Uh, the week thereafter, we will not be here. So we're skipping a week and then coming back for the final and fifth session. Um, this is where we are tonight uh, on session three, how to see how to see today's cultural crisis. And we're going to be looking at the parable of the weeds in a moment. Just uh, we're coming next week to the process of the kingdom's progress. We have a, a number of small, tiny parables that deal with the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is like, and again, we're in Matthew 13, and we will be looking at some of those smaller parables that deal with uh, how the kingdom moves forward in the world. And then our fifth and final one will be about a particular parable concerning our justly merciful master. So tonight, tonight what I want to do is I want to read with you the parable of the weeds or the weeds and the wheat. And uh, we'll read it slowly. And I want you to think of two things as we read through it. Number one, I'd like you to try to identify any surprises in the parable, any strange, unusual uh, things that you notice and that maybe raise a question in your mind. And uh, that's the first thing. So any questions, any surprises. But secondly, if you'd like also to try to identify mentally anyway, where the scenes in the parable occur. In other words, if we were to make this a play or a movie, where would the first scene stop and the second one start? And where would the second scene stop, etc.? You get the point. And uh, because because that helps us to uh, note the plot and the progression of the parable itself. So uh, I'm going to read the parable of the weeds. And by the way, we're in Matthew 13, Matthew 13. And uh, that's, uh, I remind you again what a parable is, a story comparing an earthly reality to a spiritual reality about Jesus Christ and our salvation. And that applies to what we're looking at here. It's a story. We're dealing with a, another farming situation, a field, a farmer sows seed. There's a spiritual reality behind or within the story that's being compared to this earthly reality. But the spiritual reality is going to teach us something about Jesus Christ and about the gospel and about God. And then in response and in connection with that, about our salvation. Never forget those two always go together in the Bible. As you read the Bible and you ask yourself from a particular text, maybe it's a psalm, maybe it's a parable, maybe it's a piece of history. What is this telling me about God? The next question is always, so what? So what? So what for you? So what for me? And that's what we have uh, tonight as well. So, um, Again, um, we're going to, this is what we're looking at tonight, a parable and Jesus' explanation of it. So here we go, Matthew 13, 24. Uh, we'll come back after we read this stuff just to have a little open forum, an open discussion uh, led by you, moderated by me, okay? He, that is Jesus, put another parable before them saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, an enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, then, do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, no, lest in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. And then you notice we have a section here about mustard seed, leaven, and we'll come back to that next week. And then Jesus 
in verse 34 and 35 explains again his, um, his purpose in parables. I draw your attention once again to verse 34. All these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Remember, last time we learned that at a certain point, a certain moment in Jesus' ministry, a moment that was remembered by the gospel writers, Jesus turned from teaching in discourse. Think of the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are, are the persecuted, etc. He, he moved from teaching in discourse to strictly teaching only in parables to the multitudes. And that's what this verse is telling us. And this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been, what has been since the foundation of the world. Interesting observation about this verse. You see there that it says this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. And then you have a citation, and that citation, as you can well imagine, comes from the um, Old Testament. And if you have a if you have a Bible with cross references in it, maybe you see the cross reference to Psalm 80, uh, 78, verse two, that Jesus is here citing or quoting from Psalm seventy eight, verse two, which we know is a psalm of David. Uh, what the point of interest here is that David is called a prophet. We know David as a king. I want to use this uh, to point out that the Bible uses terminology uh, very, very flexibly. I won't say loosely, but flexibly with different meanings uh, to some of these words. The word prophet, in other words, doesn't mean just a foreteller, if it means that at all. It really means forth teller, somebody who speaks forth and declares, but David is here called a prophet. But now we come to verse 36, and I'm interested here because this is the explanation of the parable that we just read. Then he, that is Jesus, left the crowds, notice he was talking to the crowds, and went into the house, and his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. Now pause a moment. I say to you every week, the editors of our Bibles often help us with headings and they entitle parables. Sometimes they do a good job. Sometimes they do a questionable job. Here the text tells, tells us what the parable is about, about the weeds, about the weeds in the field. It's a parable about the weeds in the field. Jesus answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the close of the age and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the close of the age. The son of man will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. By the way, this is the second and the last parable of which Jesus gives his own interpretation or explanation and application. We had it, we saw it last week with the parable of the sower which, or soils, if you wish, which Jesus told two times from different vantage points. Here, he offers a rather detailed explanation of the parable of the weeds. And he's identified various elements in the parable. The sower, uh, the, the, the one who sows the good seed, who are the good seed, who are the evil seed, who did that, who sowed the evil seed, and what's going to happen at the close of the age. Now, now let's go back and I invite you to help me identify in the parable, verses 34, I'm sorry, 24 and following, in the parable, what are some of the things that struck you as surprising, strange, odd, maybe generated a question? No problem if you have a question. I wonder why. Anybody?
Don't worry, your question will not be graded. If you don't have any surprises or questions, I'm going to throw some out for you to consider. Okay? What kind of a neighbor would you have that would come, you know, for a weed season? Okay, all right. What kind of a neighbor would it be? What kind of a neighbor would you have who, in the darkness of night, under the cover of darkness, would spread uh, weeds, weed seed among your good seed? He would have to be pretty malicious. He would have to be pretty downright, um, yeah, downright evil because, evil yeah, an evil man. You got that right. Remember that this field was not an 80 acre farm. It was a subsistence plot that uh, a man used to, to feed his family. He grew his grain, harvested it, sold it, and he was able to feed his family for a time. A very poor, uh, impoverished economy and a very simple lifestyle. So for a wicked man to do that is, you know, taking, taking food out of the guy's mouth, really putting his own family, his own, his own life in jeopardy. This is not a benign, it's not an uh, easily overcome kind of uh, uh, mischief. So that's, that's a good question. That's a good observation. There's something surprising here. Um, and it's, it's going to set the tone really for the story, isn't it? Because we've got in the opening scene, we've got a conflict that's emerged. Farmer sowed good seed, somebody comes with bad seed. Bingo, you got a, you got a conflict. Go ahead. Ha, 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 yes, okay. I'm, I hope you don't steal my thunder. I'm going to get at that. I'm going to leave the commentary alone. I won't speak on what it says. Okay, okay. But, but that's, a good, that's a good observation. You know, you have a garden, and you're going to raise some beans or carrots or whatever, and it's your impulse to go in there and get the weeds out so that you have a nice, uh, growing, flourishing crop. But here, here, we have the weeds that are growing alongside, uh, the, the grain, and the, the natural question is, hmm, how come? Wonder why that is. There's an answer to that question. We'll come to that in a moment. Yes? I was going to say, if the enemy, if the purpose, like, what was his purpose? Because if he was trying to destroy it, like, why didn't he just burn a field or something? Or do something, you know? Yeah. Like, like why did he sow seed that you didn't notice till later? Well, maybe they, the answer to that question is a, it's a good question, but the answer, I think, is in your last words that you wouldn't notice. In other words, he's, he's doing something that's surreptitious. He's doing something that's secretive. He's doing something he doesn't want to become, become evident and plain that is with his fingerprints on it, so to speak. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's another characteristic of the conflict that's emerging in the story. Not only is he an evil man sowing bad seed, but he's doing so uh, secretly, cover of darkness, quietly. And uh, we know somebody who works that way. Any other, any other comments? Okay, we're going to take a look with me just for a moment. This gets back to the question as to, um, you know, how come, how come they let the weeds how come they let the weeds grow to such a point that it became a threat? On the paper, what I did is I uh, photocopied for you from a, from a, uh, a Bible encyclopedia something about uh, Darnell. Again, in your Bible, maybe you have a footnote, I do in mine, that identifies this weed as Darnell. Now, maybe Darnell doesn't mean anything to you. If you like Latin, the botanical term for this weed is lolium temulentum. And in this article, it explains zizania, which is the Greek word. Darnell is equivalent to the Arab word. We're not concerned about that. The name given to several varieties uh, of which lolium temulentum, the bearded Darnell, is the one most resembling wheat. Pause a moment. Catch that. Don't read over that. This Darnell looks in leaf structure, in stalk, 
it looks exactly like wheat so that you can't tell them apart until a certain moment. And that moment, the parable tells us what that moment is. And that moment is when the, when the grain emerges, when the head of grain comes from the wheat plant, then any plant not having a head of grain obviously become, is visible, identifiable as wheat or darnel. Um, uh, uh, on the near approach, well, let's, let's just a minute. The one most uh, resembling wheat has been supposed to be degenerated wheat. On the near approach of harvest, it is carefully weeded out from among the wheat by the women and the children. Uh, the, Arab, the Arabic zuwan is commonly used as chicken's food. It is not poisonous to human beings unless infected with the mold ergo or ergata, however you pronounce that. Okay. Now, I remind you that this parable is about the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God isn't being compared to one thing, the sower, or another thing, the good seed, or another thing, the workers. The, par the kingdom of God in this parable is being likened to the whole story, the whole plot. In other words, this parable answers the question, how does the kingdom of God function in the world today? How does it, how does it manifest itself? How does it exhibit itself, okay? Now, before we go any further, I wanna clarify for you a very important point, and that is, what is the kingdom of God? If I were to ask you, turn your paper over, write a one paragraph answer to the question, what is the kingdom of God? I won't. What would you, what would you say? What is the kingdom of God? I mean, listen, we pray every time we say the Lord's prayer, thy kingdom come. What are you praying for? Do you know what you're praying for? It's a hard, challenging concept to explain because it is used in different ways in the Bible. Now, I'm gonna recommend a book that gives a good, uh, handy-dandy, hands-on explanation of the whole business of the kingdom of God. It's entitled, The World is Christ's. The World is Christ's, a subtitle, A Critique of Two Kingdoms Theology by a Dutch fellow, Willem, Willem, a good Dutch name, Awenail, Awenail. I edited the book, and uh, it's a book about the kingdom of God. Listen, I'm gonna read, this is for your benefit in case you don't know how to answer the question I posed. What's the kingdom of God? He says, the kingdom of God in its present form is the dominion of Christ over the entire creation hiding behind, but also manifested in all governing authorities in the world who are therefore servants of God. Did you know that in Romans 13, the government, the state is called by Paul, a servant of God. That's its calling. Now for those, if you should ever hear people say, well, you can't impose your morality in politics. You can't impose your morality on the state. Listen, as Christians, we confess that the state, the government, is a servant of God. It's called to serve God's interests in the world. Now, listen, a government is not the home. It's not a business. It's, it's, not, um, it's not a university. The government is called to pursue justice. And the, read Romans 13, very simply and very briefly has two callings. Punish the wrong, reward the good. What does it take to do that? Well, I suppose it's gonna take a little tax money if you're gonna run a police force, if you're gonna run an army. It takes a little bit of resources. Punish the, the, the evil, the wrong, and reward the good. And then thereby, thereby ensure that God's people in the world have what they need to operate in these other areas of life, family, education, business, etc. In my opinion, the government's task is very narrow, very small, very limited and very restricted. But my point is the government, when it does that in accordance with God's will, upholding what's right, declaring what's true, when it does that, it is serving the kingdom of God. Once again, the kingdom of God in its present form is the dominion of Christ 
over the entire creation manifested in all government authorities in the world who are therefore servants of God. Moreover, the kingdom involves the rule of Christ over the hearts and lives of those who confess to follow and serve him, whether or not they truly serve him. All right, if you're making notes, I'm going to give you three descriptive, maybe call them concentric circles of what the kingdom of God refers to throughout the Bible. All right, the first, according to John, according to John, um, chapter 3, the kingdom of God, first of all, is God's rule in the hearts of the regenerate. God's rule in the hearts of the regenerate. You notice I didn't say church. The hearts of the regenerate, a regenerate person is a person who has been born again, we know this, born again by the Spirit of God, who lives and walks by the Spirit of God, who has uh, turned away from living according to the desires of the natural flesh. Now, the second referent, the second circle of the kingdom of God can be identified with the church or all Christ confessors. All Christ confessors. Now you think, well, what did I just say? All the regenerate I just said. But listen to me. Not all Christ confessors are regenerate. You have to understand that in this age in which we live, there are people in the church who could be hypocrites, who could be insincere, who could be not sold out, shall we say, to Jesus Christ, and yet they mouth, they mouth all the right things. I love Jesus. They sing the songs. They may even be in the praise band. They could, heaven forbid, even be pastors. It can happen. You have to understand that we can't determine who is a genuine Christ confessor, regenerate Christ confessor, and who is not somebody who's faking it. As Jesus himself said in the last day, many will say, Lord, Lord, did we not cast out demons in your name and so on? Jesus is going to say, I never knew you because you didn't obey me. Now, I like to tell people that here's a, here comes a big word that God did not give us cardioanalytic ability. I cannot analyze your heart and you cannot analyze mine. He did not give us cardioanalytic ability. All you can evaluate is my walk and my talk. And if my walk and my talk seem to be fitting Jesus Christ, well, you've got to give me the benefit of the doubt and count me as part of the church. But we know from the Bible that the church can include hypocrites and those who are not really belonging to Jesus. Nonetheless, his rule goes over the church. His rule is exercised in the church. How? Most, most clearly by his word. As his word is proclaimed and as his word guides and directs the life of the congregation, um, the leaders of the congregation, together with the word of God, they get to declare they get to declare who's in and who's not by way of statements of faith. This is what we believe. By way of the exercise of church discipline, who's in and who's out. But the point I want to make is that the second concentric circle uh, with regard to the kingdom of God is the church, the, the confessing church. The third, the third concentric circle is the world. Jesus or Jesus kingdom is exercised in the world. And that's what our parable is about. That's what our parable is about tonight as well. <clears throat> Jesus governs whether we see it or not is not the point. And by the way, that's why this is a matter of faith, not sight. We confess God rules over all. God reigns. We sing God reigns. Where do you see it? Well, you don't. You don't see it except with the eyes of faith. And you see it with eyes of faith that are nourished, that are nourished and fed by the word of God. That's the only way you know that God rules. If I didn't have the Bible with the Psalms and a parable like this, if I didn't have the Bible, I wouldn't know. And therefore, I wouldn't believe 
that God rules, that God is sovereign and God reigns. So the kingdom of God is first of all over the regenerate. He rules in the hearts and lives of those born again. Secondly, he rules in his church. And though the church is mixed, nonetheless, God's word governs and directs the life of the church. And he rules in the world. He's sovereign over the, over the course of nations. He holds the hearts of princes in his hand. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what, boy, I think I went to sleep again here. Yeah, see? I have to figure this out. Uh, okay. If we... When I ask, how do we see today's crisis, and we look at the parable of the weeds, let me give you, let me give you some, some uh, description of that. I, I put this on. We've read this together. This is about Zizania, the weeds, and so on. You can see from your notes and from what I've written here the point of the similarity. Now, remember last time and the time before, we've been helping ourselves study the parables by asking what's the literary context or the home of the parable here tonight once again we're in that section where Jesus is speaking to the disciples or the crowds rather in parables and now he comes apart comes he comes separately in the house to his disciples to explain this parable at their request What's the ancestry, the Old Testament background? There's not much, I have to confess. I did some study and looking here at, uh, at, at where can we find hints and glimpses of this parable in the Old Testament? There's not a lot. There's not a lot of uh, information. There are images, of course, of seed and farming and harvesting and so on, uh, but they, are don't, they don't relate directly to the kind of story that we have in this parable. Now, here's what I want to do with you. Let's talk about the scenes, the various scenes. I'm going to read the parable again. And I'm going to invite you to stop me, stop me when you think the first scene is coming to a close, all right? Because then we're going to make a, we're going to make a point about that. So we start at 1324. It's like a story with a plot. A plot has various stages. Here we go. He, that is Jesus, put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. You think that's, a, that's, a, that's an opening scene? Okay. You notice, by the way, with your Bibles, that what follows, if you have the ESV, is not a new sentence, is it? It's not a new sentence. So don't be fooled. A scene doesn't require a capital letter at the beginning of a sentence. The first scene is that a farmer sowed good seed. That's it. Now, that, that's what farmers do. And it's a very simple story. It's a very simple scene. It's, a very, it's setting up what's coming. But we know that um, at this point, we have that very important word, good, good seed. All right, here we go. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. Another one. Another one. So we've got scene two. Scene one, planting. Scene two, we've got the, uh, the enemy. Cor evil man. The evil man, right. The evil man corrupting the field, corrupting the seed by sowing weeds, darnell. All right. So we got scene two. Here, here we go. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, <clears throat> Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. Nobody's picking a scene here yet. Yeah, okay, so so when the weeds appear, we're back now, back now in verse 26. That's another scene. That's worth thinking about, folks. That's worth thinking about. 
Because <clears throat> remember early on tonight, we already asked the question, the surprise, how come the weeds were allowed to grow? How come the weeds could grow? Answer is you couldn't tell what was weed and what was wheat until this point, until, shall we say, scene three? Scene three, then we have the weeds appear also. So then the next number four, scene four, would start in 27, and we have this dialogue, the dialogue. The servants of the master came and said, you know, didn't you sow good seed? How come it has weeds? He said, an enemy has done this. So the servants, we continue the dialogue, the servants said, then do you want us to go and gather them? Now let me ask you about that question. Do you think that's a good question, a smart question, a silly question? A, Kind of a. You can't uh, give, mix the weeds, uh, take the weeds out when they, uh, with the wheat because that might destroy the wheat. Yeah, that's what's coming in the, in the answer, isn't it? That's what's coming in the, in the next scene or the next finishing of the dialogue. In fact, let's read it a moment. He said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Do you think the motivation and intention of the servants was good, was premature, was a little bit radical? Questioning the master's ability to so good, you know. It's assuming, hey, I thought you sowed good seed. Why is this? It's questioning the master's ability in his garden. So, okay, so you would paint color, if you were coloring, you would color these questions a bit dark. I don't know. I think the servant was right. You think the servants was right? Yes, because you can't go in there and start back because you lose your crop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that was the master's solution or the master's response to the servant. But the servant said, shall we go in? Shall we go in? I think it's a pretty innocent question you know, because, you know, they want to know what to do. Yeah, they want to know what to do. In fact... I, I would submit to you, I, I, happen, I agree with you, I would submit to you that they have their master's interest in the question, their master's interest at heart, because they're concerned about what? The harvest. If we look what we see here, we see weeds and wheat. Now, if we let this go, what's going to happen, Mr. Mr. Master? You're not going to have any harvest. Shall we go in? Would you let us go in and, and separate them? In other words, their, I think their interest was the master's well-being, the master's harvest. And they wanted to protect that harvest. Thus, they asked the question, shall we go in and take care of the weeds? Now, the master says, and he's a smart guy, he understands farming. He said, no, 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 don't go in because you start pulling up those weeds and you're going to pull up the weed with them. So he says, wait. Now verse 30, look at verse 30. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I'll tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. See, at harvest time, I submit, you can afford to pull up the whole business and then separate them. But then you're going to, you're going to thrash the wheat, you're going to harvest the wheat, but then the weeds, which are separated over here, you're going to bundle up and put, excuse me, put in the harvest. You don't know what kind of root system that Darnell has, and the wheat is not right when it shows up. Okay. It's, it's not ready for harvest. It's, you just tell you got to see that on there. Okay. That's exactly right. There are two things, the readiness, ripeness of the wheat, but more importantly, underground. You cannot see the entanglement of the weeds and the wheat. That's an important, important point. For, for example, if it, he says in verse 30, when you pull up the weeds, you're going to pull up the wheat and you ask yourself, huh? How come? Why is that? I can weed my carrots and not pull the carrots out. I can weed my beans and not pull the beans. How come? The answer is they've grown so long next to each other together that the weed, uh, sorry, the roots under the surface have become intertwined. You got a question? I still go back to the question, how then does it have weeds? It's not just a matter of, okay, didn't you sow good seed? We see the weeds, can we go in? It's 
how come there's weeds mm -hmm. before they say, do you want us to go in? Okay. There is a question there that to me says there's a little doubt in the servant's trust of the master's wisdom on what to do, how these weeds got here. Uh-huh. Okay. So they have, they have a logical question. Right. How come? But yet in their logic, they are not um, satisfied yet with the master. They're sort of, with their question, pushing. I'm fully trusting him yet. Yet, yet. Okay. All right. They didn't know how, they, they didn't know what that guy did in the cover of darkness. The master may have, but. Didn't you sow good seed? Yeah. And how come these. Yeah. Right, right, right. Okay. Say again. Yeah, where was where was the master? Yeah, he was probably awake. His men his men were sleeping. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So the uh, the master knows more than the servants and he's directing what's going to happen and they need they need to trust him okay all right so we we sort of under understood the body structure of the parable this there's this sowing component there's this uh, corruption component there's this um, suddenly discovery of what had gone on component and then we have the master who really seems to take charge. And he says, no, let them grow together. And when the harvest comes, I, I will take care of it. I'll send out the reapers. Don't you, don't you worry about it. Okay. All right. We've, we've been talking a lot about the incongruities, the surprises. And I want to move ahead to um, help you understand what I think is going on here. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to offer you these comments <clears throat> under, under a kind of a theme which I think is being taught to us here uh, by, the, by the parable, okay? And here's the theme. We're talking about the Son of Man. By the way, where, can somebody quickly in your Bibles identify in the parable and its explanation where we find the phrase Son of Man? Thirty-seven. Okay, thirty-seven. It says. <clears throat> let's see here, just a minute. I gotta. The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. Does anybody know where that phrase comes from? They don't have that identified by way of um, a cross reference, but it comes from Daniel. It comes from Daniel, Daniel 12, Daniel 7, Daniel 10. The phrase son of man is an Old Testament phrase and it points to, uh, it points ahead to the Messiah. It points ahead to the coming of Jesus Christ. But if you read Daniel, we won't go in there tonight, but Daniel is a lot about kingdoms that rise and fall, kingdoms that are destroyed, kingdoms that resist God, and the Son of Man comes and he destroys these resisting kingdoms. So the Son of Man is like, if I were to say to you, if I were to say to you, um, uh, if I were to use the name or, or, or a phrase, the father of our nation, you would associate that with whom? George Washington. It's that kind of association that Jesus' listeners would have had with the Son of Man. He says the, son of, the, the one who sowed the seed, good seed is the son of man. Whoa. All right, now what we're going to get, folks, is we're going to get a perspective on history. That's really the burden of tonight's lesson. We're going to get a perspective on history because the son of man reveals the secret of his patience. Remember, the master in the parable now is the son of man. The master in the parable of G is Jesus. All right, so now we've got to do a little transposition here. We've got to do a little translation. 
The seed is the word of God. The seed is the kingdom and so on. But the son of man is Jesus. So he's at work in this parable and he's revealing to us something about the secret of his patience exercised throughout world history. How's that for a philosophy of history? That's what this parable is teaching us. You know, some parables teach us um, secrets about uh, righteousness, secrets about love and compassion and mercy. This parable is teaching us the secret, the mystery of why Jesus doesn't come back yet. Why he doesn't come back yet. That is to say, why he exercises patience. The first thing we look at is the background, the background of his patience. <clears throat> the background. And the background is the kingdom of God comes into history like seed sown in a field. The sower is Jesus. What's the goal of the farmer when he sows his seed? It's simple. What is it? Harvest. That's right. He wants a good crop. When you plant your tomatoes, Alex, you want to see those red things on the vine, don't you? That's right. You don't plant it just to go out and water and walk away and watch the birds pick away your fruit. You want to eat the fruit. The goal of sowing is harvest. We know in the Bible, harvest is a metaphor for the last judgment, the end of the world. So Jesus, the kingdom of heaven, comes into history like seed sown in a field. The sower is Jesus. The good seed refers to the sons of the kingdom. The field is the world. But here's the first astonishing surprise. When the kingdom of God comes into history, think Jesus Christmas, think Jesus pre preaching and teaching the word. When the kingdom of God comes into history, it encounters resistance. Now you might say, what's new about that? Wait a minute. If God is all powerful, omnipotent, if God is all powerful, how can resistance mount against God? How can there be resistance against the kingdom? How can there be resistance against the word of God? Here's a question. How could there be resistance against Jesus Christ? And there was. We know because last week we looked at those passages. How they conspired to destroy him. How they mocked him. How they rejected his authority and his claims. You see that? The word of God, does it ever surprise you that when the word of God comes with all of its clarity, you get it, you hear it, you understand it, and you say, how come not everybody understands it? God, as a, in a certain sense, and I don't mean to be disrespectful here, God allows himself to be resisted. He allows himself, his word, his savior, his son, to be resisted in history. The sower sows good seed, but during the night, an enemy comes and sows other seed. You wonder, I hope you don't, you wonder why there's conflict in the world today? You wonder why this conflict is escalating? You wonder why this conflict is being allowed? Your understanding of history answers that question. That's what this parable is teaching us. As I say, the weed, as you know by now, is a special kind of weed. And we've already talked about how it, how it forms, how it comes to manifestation. But I guess before moving along to the, to the next point in the stage of the parable, I want you to understand something about your life. I want you to understand something about what happens here in church on Sunday. We believe that the preaching of the gospel opens up the doors of the kingdom of heaven. Yes? The preaching of the gospel opens up the doors of the kingdom of heaven and says, all who believe in Jesus Christ enter 
come. But do you know that on Sunday morning, that very same preaching activates the gates of hell? It does. Whenever you have a declaration of the rule of God, the sovereignty of God, the power of God, you have Satan, the great neighbor, <laughs> so to speak, sowing the bad seed, coming right along, whispering in our ears, whispering in the world, whispering in culture. It ain't so. It's old fashioned. It's backward. Nobody believes that anymore. The preaching of the gospel always has this twofold effect. It flings open the doors of the kingdom and it activates the gates of hell. Sunday, was it last Sunday we saw baptism? That water of baptism signals two things. It signals washing, cleansing, by the blood of Jesus, yes, but it also signals burial, or another word that we like to use when we're around Lake Michigan, drowning, drowning. That water symbolizes, I say symbolize, it doesn't do, but it symbolizes the cleansing of all of our sins in the blood of Jesus Christ, and it symbolizes the death, the drowning, the judgment of the flood and of the Red Sea. By the way, there, in the Bible, there's a very strong parallel between baptism and the Red Sea. Do you know that in the Red Sea, there were people who were saved and there were people who drowned? Do you know that in the flood, water, there were people who were saved, Noah and his family, and there were people who drowned? That water has that, uh, symbolically now, has that twofold effect. And so does the gospel. So does the kingdom of God. It activates the gates of hell. Wherever, see, Satan is the great imitator, right? <clears throat> Satan is the great imitator. You come to church and you want fellowship. Shall I tell you where another place where fellowship can be had? The bar. The bar. Anything we have as a church, as a congregation, can be imitated, duplicated, replicated falsely out there in the world. Fellowship, discipline. Shall I tell you how discipline works today? Church discipline. I'm using church in quotes. Church discipline works with DEI. Diversity, equity, and inclusion. Wokeism. If you don't hew the party line, you get demoted or you get fired. That's a form of church discipline. And I'm not exaggerating. It is a form of church discipline because this is a religion we're talking about here. I hope you see that. It's a religion competitive to Christianity. The, the devil imitates everything, anything that the Son of God comes through. He's the great imitator. Wherever true doctrine is taught, false teaching latches on. And get this lives off the truth like a parasite. Do you know that Satan can never create anything? He doesn't have a creative bone in his body. Satan is a parasite. And everything that he does, everything he leads people to do is parasitical. You have true doctrine, here comes the false doctrine. And by the way, you know, the, you know how heresy begins? Heresy never begins by what's said. Heresy begins by what's not said. Remember that. Heresy always begins by what is not said. And that's Satan. Anyway, this resistance that occurs when the good seed is sown and the, the wicked neighbor comes and sows bad seed is the pattern of church history. It's the pattern of church history. It's the pattern of the 21st century. And it is the pattern of your life and mine. Haven't you ever noticed this tension, this opposition, this resistance in your own life, in your own heart? How many times haven't you resolved to do fill in the blank? And along comes the devil and says, oh, you don't have time for that today. Eh, you've got another priority over here. What's going to happen if you let these people down? 
There it goes. That's how your life goes too. God, so, uh, Jesus sows good seed, the seed of the kingdom in your heart, in your life. And along comes the devil and he sows bad seed. And now you've got the conflict. You've got the conflict raging right within you. Let's not, by the way, let's not stare ourselves blind on the world out there and those conflicts, which are bad enough, heinous, stinky, gross, dirty. Let's not stare ourselves blind and forget to look here inside at ourselves, at our own hearts, our own capacities for evil. All right. Well, the background of the patience that Jesus exercises in world history is the resistance to the gospel. Let's talk about the beneficiaries of his patience. Remember, his patience is exercised in response to his servants. Now, I call, I would consider his servants perceptive fellows with regard to that second comment, shall we go in and take out the weeds? They had their, their master's interest at heart. They were thinking about the harvest. They knew that, that if they didn't act, and here's the key, if they didn't act to do something, the harvest would be lost. So the first thing that comes to mind is get those weeds out of the field. The servants, now let's translate this. I think the servants are concerned that the wheat or the sons of the kingdom are going to be lost, are going to be at risk. The presence of the sons of Satan alongside the sons of God in the world threatens the harvest. To put it another way, the presence of unbelief puts faith at risk. None of us would deny that, I think. None of us. That's the reality, the pattern of history. Far better to separate the weeds and the wheat now for the sake of protecting the good seed until the harvest. But notice the master's response in verse 20, 29. He said, no, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest, and then I'll send reapers. So let me ask you, Jesus hasn't come back yet. Jesus hasn't put an end to this mess, this resistance, this conflict in the world. Today, Jesus did not come back. Why? For whose benefit? If you read the parable, it's for the benefit of the wheat. It's for the benefit of the sons of the kingdom. If Jesus, he hasn't, if Jesus hasn't come back today, it's for your benefit that he didn't. Because you are not ripe enough. You, I, I include me with you, we are not ripe enough. The wheat isn't ready. Why does he exercise patience in world history? Why does he postpone judgment? For the sake of the wheat. For the sake of the wheat. And I talked about ripe enough. You're not ripe. We're not ripe enough. But there's more. We are so entangled with things in the world out there. And I don't mean negatively. I don't mean negatively. Our lives are so intertwined that it's not time yet. We're not able. God is not able. Jesus is not able to exercise judgment. So listen between the time of sowing and the time of harvesting is the time for growing, growing. So you've got to ask yourself the question. As every new year comes around, new birthday, new day, have you grown? Have you grown? Have you matured? Have you ripened? Have you gotten more ready today than yesterday for the return of Jesus Christ? Now is not the time for crusades against idolaters. 
if you know what I mean. Now is not the time to take the weed whacker in the field. Now is not the time. Because you see, we would be injured. We would be hurt and damaged if that happened. Not yet is it the time. The time is coming. I hope, I hope you look forward to it. You confess in the Apostles' Creed that you look forward to the, the Lord Jesus Christ coming back to judge the living and the dead. I hope that that is not a threat but a comfort. He is coming to judge the living and the dead. He is coming to make right, put right, declare right, set right all this wickedness and evil that has been amassed against him and his people, the church. And when that day comes, we will be ready for it, and so will he. He'll be ready to separate the weeds from the wheat. Let's pause a moment. Let me remind you <clears throat> by way of some application here that by necessity we live in the world and in the world we are mixed up with unbelievers entangled in civic affairs economic structures political processes we are we vote right next to our neighbors who deny the Lord Jesus Christ we go to the same shopping malls, grocery stores. We use the same highways. We are entangled in this world with unbelievers who deny the Savior we love and serve. That's not a negative statement. That's not a criticism of Christians. But it helps us understand, doesn't it, why Jesus hasn't come back. We're not ready. We're not ready. And things are too enmeshed and entangled yet to be sorted out. The wheat needs to be sorted from the weeds, and he's going to do that. If judgment were come, would come today to end it all, the sons of the kingdom would be uprooted and destroyed along with the sons of darkness. Divine patience, divine patience is for our sanctification, for our growth in holiness and godliness. We are the beneficiaries of his patience and his delay. We're the beneficiaries. The fact that we're here tonight means that the, 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 the return of Christ has been delayed one more day. One more day for the purpose of of us growing and coming to repentance for the first time maybe. But as you well know, Luther would say, the Christian life is simply a life of repentance, isn't it? It's a life of constant repentance and forgiveness and forgiveness that we receive for our sins. Okay, so we're the beneficiaries, but what about the boundary? the limit of his patience. When the grain is fully ripe, says the master, when the grain is fully ripe, I will send the reapers, I'll tell the reapers, gather the weeds first, bind them in bundles to be burned, and gather the wheat into my barn. You know, <laughs> isn't it interesting? in a church with a preacher and so on, to use a fishing analogy, you get the fish, you get the kind of fish you set the bait for, don't you? And if in the preaching you never hear about God's judgment, you never hear about the coming wrath of God against sin and apostasy and rebellion. If, by the way, remember what I said about heresy? It always begins with what you don't hear, okay? How many times are we hearing today that the, the, the patience of God has a limit? I think, I think we need to sound that note a little more loudly and a little more clearly that God is not going to put up with this forever. Well, when's he going to, we don't know. Well, are you telling me he's going to come? Yeah, I'm telling you he's going to come. 
Are you telling me he's going to he's going to throw this this world into fire? Yep, that's what's going to happen. When? I don't know. How come how come he hasn't come yet? Cuz I'm not ready. You are, but I'm not. <laughs> you mean I mean the unbeliever they're ready to be judged. They've done enough to offend God, but but listen. Today is the day of grace, isn't it? Today is the day of grace. And as long as he delays his coming, is another day an opportunity for repentance and coming to Jesus. By the way, these harvesters have two tasks, and this is what's going to happen when Jesus returns. Separation and destination. Barn, fire pile. I don't know if you remember, this is a long time ago now, we talked about creation. Remember when we were talking about worldview, we talked about creation as differentiation, that God separated. Read Genesis 1 and count the times the word separation is used. He separated the firmament, you know, from the, the day from the night. He separated. Creation was an act of separation. Ever since creation, people have been trying to erase those boundaries. Erase those boundaries. That's what's going on today. With all of this confusion about sexual identity and so on, people are erasing boundaries. People are taking to themselves the prerogatives of being a creator. I'll create my own identity. Well, at the last judgment, we're going to have one final separation again. And all of these erasures that have happened throughout history, all of this trying to turn over God's order that has happened throughout history is going to be set right when he separates the weeds from the wheat. And the destination, of course, is his barn and the fire pile. So, <clears throat> I guess part of my exhortation to you tonight is this. Are you ready for the harvest? And if so, don't get nervous. Relax. Careful, don't misunderstand that. But when I say relax, I'm saying put the sickle down. Put the sickle down. It's not up to us to clear the field of the weeds. He'll do that when he comes back. We can rest quietly, patiently, not being nervous about the prosperity of the wicked, even if they occupy positions of influence. Let the word do its work in the world. And what does the word do? It sprouts. Sprouts new sons and daughters of the kingdom. Every Lord's Day, as the word is preached around the world, sons and daughters of the king are born. It's interesting Jesus says at the end of this explanation, he who has ears, and most of us here tonight have two on the sides of their head. He who has ears, ears let him hear. What is he saying? Let both grow together. Now that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be out there fighting for righteousness, fighting against unrighteousness. It doesn't mean that at all. It just means you do that fighting, you do that confronting. You do that agitation and work without nervousness, without anxiety that it's up to you to set these things straight, because it's not. The Lord, in his time, will separate the weeds and the wheat, and then you righteous fruit bearers will shine and sparkle. Isn't it nice from week to week we come here, and I, by the way, I think that's why Sunday is so important. Because Sunday is a day for sowing the seed of the Word of God. And we come week after week after week and we say to ourselves, boy, nothing's changed. In fact, if anything, it's gotten worse. Nothing has changed. This parable gives us a philosophy of history that teaches us why it appears nothing has changed. It's so that we who sit here, we who confess the name of Jesus, have another week, another day, another year to grow, to grow in faith and produce fruit. Feedback, any comments? 
Questions? Yeah. Able to mature properly. Right, 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 right. Now you've heard me. You've heard me defend the legitimacy, say, of Christian organizations, huh? Where you have a Christian school, you might have a Christian businessman's organization. You might, you might even have a Christian business. But even if you, let's say, you have a Christian business. Some of you guys are businessmen. You hire unbelievers, right? Presumably, you need the skill. Maybe you need a graphics designer. Maybe you need some kind of vice president of marketing or whatever. You hire unbelievers. This isn't telling us to push them away or make sure they meet a certain code of morality before they can come work. Although, although as a Christian business, you would have a code of morality that shouldn't be violated and that needs to be communicated, et cetera. But we're not called to get out of the world, ex exit the world, go on an island, and, you know, be our own commune, so to speak. It's, it's very difficult, isn't it, to take the middle path. Not, not this one, not that one. See, you don't want to separate from the world, neither do you want to become immersed in the world, but you want to stand out in the world for what's right. Yeah. But it's also another point to pick up what you're saying is that we, wheat, need each other in the field. We really need each other. I need to look around. Hey, there's, there's some wheat. There's some over there. I'm not alone. I'm not alone. I may feel alone sometimes in my work, in my neighborhood, my family even. I may feel alone, but I'm not alone. Okay. Other comments? Comments? Give up on the love of God and the word of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ and keep the spiritual up and that's right. Keep your head up and right. pay attention to that. Keep your mind solely on that. Yeah. Keep producing fruit. Fruit. Right? You're never you're never too old to keep producing fruit. Right. The fruit of kindness, gentleness, patience, self control. Love, peace, Galatians 5.22. That's why we're still here tonight. <laughs> That's why he hasn't come. So we can keep producing fruit. Yeah, go ahead. I think the, the growing together is, is really good because, I mean, we're in the world and we do need to focus on that separation because it's, it's hard, especially when you want to talk about neighbors. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And I have to try not be in that world when I'm going through those experiences. Yeah. Be a different, someone different than the world. Yeah. You know, which is very difficult. It is. But, you know, it, it's comforting to us to know that in this parable, the master says, let them both grow together, right? And as they grow together, the wheat doesn't become weed. Okay. You still keep your identity until the Lord comes back. And so we, we got to be careful not to press the parable too much. But your point, you know, you don't want to simply cash it in and go to the other side and fold in with the other side and to maintain your distinctive identity as Christ did is the challenge and the and the and the calling, quite frankly. Yeah. That's why I'm, I'm very impressed and I'm very moved by people, people like you, people who are in the workaday world, people who are in among unbelievers with your work, with your job, who have developed techniques, disarming techniques to communicate their witness, communicate their testimony. I once, I, I used to, I had a very, very short stint working in a labor union in college in a, for a painter. And uh, 
I had an elderly gentleman who was my tutor. I was his apprentice. He was showing me things about painting. And, and, uh, and he, he, he showed me how to handle people who curse, people who take the name of the Lord in vain. And if you've ever worked in a factory, I've talked to people who work in factories. They say that's probably the hardest thing they have to put up with. It's people who swear all day long and people who, you know, they take the Lord's name. One thing, it's one thing to have profanity, you know, the four letter words. It's another thing to have blasphemy. That's different. Blasphemy, taking the name of the Lord Jesus in vain. And one time somebody did that in his presence. Oh, you know him too? How did you get to know him? Well, that guy didn't have much to say about knowing that. Well, he's a friend of mine, you know, and I appreciate it if you wouldn't use my friend's name like that. If you get my drift. That's all he said. And it was enough to embarrass the guy, but he didn't. He just let, walked away from it quickly, made his point. And, you know, I've had the experience as a pastor being on a golf course when people didn't know who I was. And you, sign, you, you get in with a foursome, an anonymous foursome, and, boy, I mean, the air is blue. And they, you're on the first tee and you're, you know, you're getting ready to go. And so what do you do for a living? Well, I'm a pastor and you can watch them all swallow real hard. <laughs> and have, for the rest of the 18, it's pretty clean. It's pretty clean because they don't want to, you know, embarrass themselves but around the pastor. But anybody else comment? Yeah, in the church where we're all professing. Yeah, you get weeds and wheat. Well, I was at a memorial for a saint that um, I grew up with. Uh huh. Um, I loved her dearly, but I was talking to a young man who um, had been close with um, my nieces and nephews growing up and, and in the church. And he made a comment that um, he was talking to a family member of mine recently and that this person said well God's intention all along was to walk with man and man screwed it up so he had to come up with plan B oh, God's intention so, so his intention was plan A walk with man and man screwed, and man screwed it up and therefore Jesus going to the cross was plan B plan B uh huh uh huh. And so I immediately said, oh, well, I disagree. I said, is God sovereign? I said, he knew all along what was going to happen. That was his plan from the beginning. We are not plan B. Yeah, right. And this young man, well, he's young. He's not younger than me. Um, he's, he has a Mensa card. Uh. You know. Uh huh. Mensa, supposed to be smart. And it's like, yeah. I didn't know what to do with it. Yeah, right. And I was just, I wasn't yeah. combative. I wasn't, and I said, I, I disagree. I said, this yeah. is sovereign. And God yeah. had this planned all along, and we're not plan B. And then I just went on talking about something else. Yeah, yeah. Well, isn't it interesting? You know, you, a guy says, man messed it up. God has to come around to rescue. Unbeknown to him, here comes plan B. You know, that's one thing about this parable too, that we need to keep in mind along with your conversation with that person. Nothing surprises God. Nothing in history surprises God. That's why this master, we read about this master, you know, uh, the, the, the worker saying, ha, huh, there's weeds in the field. How come? Oh, a guy did it, says the master. He knew. He wasn't surprised, and he was going to deal with it at the right time. But it's also the arrogance of man to think that we could screw up God's plans. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we can mess up ourselves, right. and we can mess up creation, but we don't mess up God's plan. Right. No, that's true. Yeah. Could the maturity of the seed in the, if we take the, the history from God's foreknowledge before the foundation of the world, 
broadcasting of the seed. He knew he was going to do that. To the reaping, the, the final judgment, could it be the fruition of that seed maturing? Could the maturity be the regeneration of all men in all generations up until the judgment? Of some men in all generations. Of all the men that were foreknown, the seed that was broadcasted. Oh, the good seed. Sons, the good seed. The fruition yeah. of that in history yeah. in all generations before the judgment. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. We may, we may see it not only as a perspective on our own history today, but a perspective on all of history as the outworking, the outworking of God's decree, of God's foreknowledge. Yep. Yep. Which means, of course, that, you know, what, you have to understand what we're experiencing today, what we're looking at and watching today is not new. This isn't for the first time that this kind of resistance, conflict, and opposition has arisen. And, uh, you know, it could, could very well get a lot, lot, lot worse before it gets better. So, but until then, we keep growing. We keep maturing. Anything else? Yes. Yeah, it's a good question. The question has to do with visible and invisible church. And it's, it's a, di a distinction that, and terms that are subject to misunderstanding, as often happens in theology. Um, the invisible church is visible to God. It's just not visible to us. And the invisible church refers to all the truly regenerate, which is redundant. Okay, if you're regenerate, you're truly regenerate. But the church visible, that is the church we see, is the mixed company. It's the mixed company. So we can identify the kingdom of God with the regenerate, invisible church. That's its purest, purest sense. But we can also identify, because the Bible does, as in this parable, as a mixed, mixed company. And then there's the world over here, which is really, really mixed. But <clears throat> I think that in the history of the church, the church has always faced the need to protect itself from heresy, protect itself from what Jude calls, Jude calls the increepers, people who creep in to sow immorality and dissension. We always have to be on guard and alert to that. That's why, you know, being an elder and being a leader and being a pastor in a church is a very, very difficult job because you've got to have a number of radar senses that are operating all the time to be able to see when something, think of a tree, think of a tree with the trunk and the branch. You know, over here, there's not much of a gap. There's not much of a difference between that little branch going off that tree. But a couple of years, by the time you get out here, look at the distance between the trunk and the branch. And that's what you've got to be able to spot as a leader. You've got to be able to spot that way back here. Whoa, whoa, whoa. If we don't nip that, if we don't address that, if we don't deal with that, down the road it's going to be here. So, yeah, I think, <clears throat> I think this calls us to vigilance in the visible church and it calls us to comfort as well in the invisible church if we're born again if we're regenerated if we believe in the lord jesus christ and follow him you know the, we can't wait for the harvest we're eager eager for the harvest for a lot of reasons yeah. all right listen i think it's time that we uh, draw to a close let me offer closing prayer okay Father in heaven, we thank you for the perspective that you give us through our Lord Jesus Christ and this parable on uh, human history, our history, 
as well as the history of the world. We thank you for your patience, Father, in sending your son back to earth to judge the living and the dead. We thank you that that patience is designed for our growth, for our development, and for our maturing. And with, <clears throat> as we look about and we see the growth and escalation of wickedness and of uh, heresy and of apostasy and infidelity, we wonder why you don't stop it and when you're going to stop it and what you're going to do to stop it. But Father, we pray that you'll focus the eyes of our hearts on the purpose and the beneficiaries of your delay, that we may cultivate ourselves and others in the growth of the fruit of the Spirit, love, peace, self-control, patience, that we may cultivate the fruit until the time comes when you will send forth your angels to separate the weeds and the wheat and bring the wheat into your barn to enjoy, to enjoy eternity with you. Bless us through these teachings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.